Good afternoon. Uh, my name is John Morgan. I'm the director of the Theatres Trust, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the 2024 Theatres at Risk Register launch event, sponsored by Tizer's Live Insurance Brokers. I've got a few housekeeping things to go through first before we kick off. Um, your video and microphones will have been turned off when you joined the room, and we request that you keep them turned off, please, for the duration today, unless you're a guest speaker. Uh, so speakers and panel members will be unmuted and invited to share their video when required by the host. Also, just to remind you, we are recording this session for our records and future communications. So if you're not comfortable with your attendance being recorded, then we would advise you to, to leave the meeting. We've enabled captioning for the event. So if you'd like to make use of this, please select a live transcript. It's the small CC button on your Zoom toolbar and our team will approve this for you. There are options to view the full transcript or subtitles depending on your preference. Our suggestion will be to be uh, to choose show subtitles. Due to the content and information being shared during the launch, this session is best enjoyed in side-by-side -side speaker view. You can select this in the top right-hand side of your screen uh, uh, from the view menu. We hope you enjoy the panel discussions that are going to follow later on. And if you wish to submit a question, please do so using the chat box on the Zoom toolbar. Uh, your, uh, and include your name, your organization, as well as your question. If you've got any technical issues, please use the chat box again, but send your message directly to the Theatres Trust host rather than to everyone in the room. Uh, and a member of our team will do their best to assist you. Um, you can also turn off pop-up chat box notifications by clicking on the chat button located along the bottom of the Zoom menu and then unticking the show chat previews uh, box. This will stop pop-ups from distracting you throughout the session. And that's all the housekeeping stuff. Um, as you can see, we've got a packed program today. But before I introduce the first of our speakers, I just want to say a little bit about Theatres Trust and about the Theatres at Risk Register. So as most of you will know, Theatres Trust is the national public advisory body for theatres in the UK and the statutory consultee in the planning system. We are a charity and the own organisation that provides free advice and support to all of the UK's theatres, whether they are historic, modern, subsidised, commercial, volunteer or local authority run. We support three theatres through our free advice service, through our planning application responses and through our grants programmes. And we do this because we believe people should have access to theatres wherever they live across the country so they can engage in creative activity and attend live performances. Theatres have a positive role to play in placemaking, contributing to the local economy and to people's well-being, making our villages, towns and cities great places to live, work and visit. We're going to hear some specific examples from some of our speakers later on today. Supporting Theatres at Risk is a key part of our work, and today we're announcing our annual Theatres at Risk list. This highlights theatre buildings across the UK which are most at risk of being lost, whether through threat of closure, redevelopment or demolition. It's the 18th year of this list, and over that time, more than 80 theatres have been removed from the list for positive reasons. In other words, have been saved, as they've either been restored, revived or had a suitable replacement planned. This year's list consists of 39 theatres with two new additions and one theatre removed. And you'll hear more about this in due course. Of the theatres that were already on the list, some are already making steady progress, while others are looking to be in jeopardy, despite passionate community support. And beyond the list, much of the theatre sector is struggling with the cost of living crisis and uh, uh, so hitting so soon after the pandemic, and alongside that, standstill or reducing <clears throat> local authority funding. We're providing support to a number of theatres, working together with them to prevent more vital buildings from being added to the list in the future. And this is why your support is so important and your passion for theatres. It's great to have so many of you here today joining us in this discussion, how we can protect and revive the UK's theatres. So I'm really glad to see you all here today. So I'm going to hand over now uh, to uh, our first speaker, Lord Parkinson, who is Minister for Arts and Heritage and DCMS Lords Minister. 
he had an initially uh, planned to attend in person, but unfortunately, due to a diary clash, uh, he's had to uh, send a pre-recorded message, which he's kindly done. So I will hand over to, to Lord Parkinson just now. Good afternoon. I'm sorry that I'm not joining you live today, as I have for the past couple of years, but as you watch this, I'll be on my way back from a memorial service for Peter Brook, a former Secretary of State at the Department for National Heritage, the precursor, of course, to today's Department for Culture, Media and Sport. As Secretary of State in the early 1990s, Lord Brook helped to bring about the National Lottery, which has played such an important role over the last 30 years, funding and enabling all manner of cultural and heritage projects. He was also one of the many ministers who've had the pleasure of working with the Theatres Trust, which we're so proud to have as an arm's length body of our department since it was established by Act of Parliament in 1976. As the opening line of that Act of Parliament makes clear, the Trust's objective is to promote the better protection of theatres for the benefit of the nation. It came about thanks to a private member's bill brought forward by a Conservative MP, David Crouch, but supported by all the parties and inspired by a high-profile public campaign supported by Equity, the Actors' Union, to save London's theatres, which famously involved forming a human chain around the Shaftesbury Theatre to stop it being knocked down. Almost 50 years on, the Theatres' Trust forms a protective and very human chain around theatres across the UK, although without necessarily having to link arms physically. A key part of that work is the annual Theatres at Risk Register, which highlights and rallies support for the theatre buildings at greatest risk across the country. These buildings are more than simply physical edifices, they're the beating hearts of our cultural heritage. Down the centuries our theatres have been the crucibles for storytelling, creativity and collective experience. They've nurtured brilliant artists and timeless plays, groundbreaking performances and the evolution of our cultural identity, not to mention the life-changing effect that they've inspired in the countless generations who've sat in their seats and been transfixed by what they've seen on stage. They stand as testament to the power of the human spirit, enriching our lives and touching our souls. That's why it's essential that we do as much as we can to preserve these inspiring places for future generations. Over the years, the Theatres Trust has worked tirelessly with campaign groups, local authorities, Historic England and many more to save over 80 theatres at risk of closure or demolition. This includes Liverpool's Royal Court, which I had the pleasure of visiting in November. This Grade 2 listed building with its fine Art Deco features has been at the heart of Merseyside's life for nearly 200 years, but by 2009 it was in extremely poor repair. The Theatres Trust played a vital role in its renovation, advising on charity arrangements and business planning and helping to secure a long-term lease on the theatre. It helped with the tendering for architects and planning and provided letters of support for fundraising. The advisory review that you led looked at architectural and operational issues as well as providing feedback on environmental and construction matters. It led to improvements to both front of house and backstage areas including improved accessibility throughout. It was also used to inform the Royal Court submission for Arts Council funding. Since then, the theatre has gone from strength to strength, becoming a national portfolio organisation in 2018 and continuing to entertain audiences with its iconic Christmas show, which was just getting underway when I visited. And it continues to benefit from the work of the Theatres Trust, receiving a grant from your Small Grants programme to purchase technology to enable people with hearing and visual impairments to access productions in the main house and in its studio theatre. Just one of many ways the Trust is helping everyone to enjoy the life-changing experience of the theatre. Last year you continued to deliver a range of programmes supporting a number of theatres across the country which are facing difficulties. You began your three-year Resilient Communities programme, made possible by support from the National Lottery Heritage Fund amongst others. As part of this project, you've also finalised work on your skills bank, which will give essential support to the in-house team, which offers specialist advice to the sector. Alongside this work, the Theatres Trust provided more than £60,000 of grant funding to support seven theatres at risk. All of this amounts to an exceptional, exceptional year of vital work to help protect and preserve our theatres. 
So to this year's risk register, where sadly we have two new additions. Abbeydale Picture House in Sheffield, where severe deterioration of the auditorium ceiling means that it is not currently safe for public use. And the Epstein Theatre in Liverpool, which was added to the list following its closure last summer. As ever though, the list reflects a number of steps forward as well as step these steps back, with some amazing work and real progress made by local campaign groups and engaged local authorities. I'm also proud to say that a number of venues on the register are being supported through direct government funding. Spilsby Sessions House secured a levelling up fund uh, grant for a capital works project in January last year, alongside an emergency funding grant from Historic England. Both these applications were supported by the Theatres Trust. And in March last year, Morecambe Winter Gardens was awarded £2.7 million through the Cultural Development Fund for works to see the building opened to full capacity. That same month, I visited the Theatre Royal in Margate, another of the entries on the register. Thanet Council was successful in its bid to the government's Towns Fund and has allocated £2.2 .2 million of the money that it was awarded towards the cost of making the Theatre Royal fit for purpose. A steering group, which includes the Theatres Trust, was set up to advise on the economic and business case for this element of the Towns Fund bid. In April last year, Thanet Council was awarded funding from the Theatres Trust's Resilient Theatres, Resilient Communities programme to undertake a statement of heritage significance and to carry out further community consultation and market testing to support future funding bids. Just before Christmas, the public and operator engagement work began, with the Council revealing its vision for the theatre and a nearby building as a performing arts hub. Best of luck to you with the next steps in that project. Other positive developments that we've seen over the last 12 months have included Burnley Empire securing support from the government's Shared Prosperity Fund, while Ramsbottom Co-op Hall had a successful bid to the Community Ownership Fund. These are all positive steps forward, and I have great faith that over the coming months we can look forward to more success stories like them. The Trust's work is, of course, not short of challenges. The last few years were a period of great turbulence, with the compound impact of the pandemic, supply chain pressures and the increased cost of energy and materials. We also had to navigate the issues raised by reinforced autoclaved aerated concrete, an acronym that none of us has been glad to learn, which forced a number of theatres to close their doors for a while. And I know that some of the theatres represented here today are still facing substantial difficulties. But I also know that the people on the line today bring a huge amount of creativity and energy to addressing those challenges. And I hope that I can reassure you that the government is listening and working with you to address them. From the increased budget that we've provided to Arts Council England, which allowed it in turn to increase its support for theatre in the, la the latest funding round, to the really important extension to theatre tax relief, which was announced last spring, I hope you know that the government really is behind you as you face up to these challenges. As Minister for Arts and Heritage, I'm proud to continue the work of Peter Brook, David Crouch, and countless people of all parties and none who know what vital amenities our theatres are. Not just bricks and mortar, but places which transport us provoke us and enrich our souls. So thank you to the Theatres Trust and to everyone here today for all that you do to ensure that these magical places can change the lives of people for generations to come. I hope that this year's register and the rest of today's event are a great success. Thank you, Lord Parkinson. Um, really great to hear your words of support uh, today and also encouraging to hear about how many theatres at risk have benefited from government funding uh, over the last year. Uh, it's also a real testament to those uh, campaign groups who have worked so hard to develop credible plans that uh, mean that they are in a place where they can, can realistically apply for, for support and funding to make the next steps on their journey. Um, 
I'm delighted now to introduce our next speaker, um, Siobhan Redmond, who many many of you will know. Uh, she's a, a longtime ambassador of the Theatres Trust and a great supporter of our work, and indeed of the work that um, you are all doing uh, with your campaign groups across the UK. Um, she's joined today by Jack Davenport. They are both uh, in rehearsal at the moment for uh, The Human Body, which opens next month at the Don Mar Warehouse. And uh, Siobhan will uh, briefly explain why, why Jack is joining her. I know, with the timing that got me where I am today, I'm losing my voice. But fortunately, as John said, I'm working with a company of lovely actors and one of them, Jack Davenport, has agreed to read my speech for me. So it's a result for you. He's reading my words. So any issues you have with the content, please take up with me. And in the meantime, here is my more than glamorous understudy, Mr. Jack Davenport. Hello, everyone. Um, well, you stole the line I was going to open with about being your far less glamorous understudy. But there we go. I still am that. Um, anyway, to, to business. Um, this is Siobhan's uh, speech for you all. Hello to all of you friends of the Theatres Trust. Apologies for the drama and apologies to those of you who have already heard me talking about theatre. My feelings haven't changed, simply strengthened. I am delighted to be an ambassador for Theatre's Trust because theatre transformed my childhood. It sparked my imagination, broadened my horizons and opened up for me a world of new possibilities. I feel passionately, and I guess you do too, that that experience should be available to everyone. Theatres are special places. We enter them and go into the dark in the company of strangers in the hope that something rare and beautiful and transformative will happen to take us outside our daily life, will perhaps illuminate that life. Theatre gives us access to a mysterious in-between world and it's uniquely placed to show all that we can be at our best and at our worst. It offers us celebration and consolation. It could perform alchemy on the people that are there that day in the auditorium, backstage and on stage. An alchemy that is particular to those people there in that moment. That magic is elusive, but when it happens, the memory of it can stay with us forever. As we emerge from the necessary isolation of the pandemic and from the many changes we've undergone as individuals and as a people in the last decade, we may find ourselves, as I do, and not simply as a natural consequence of the aging process, feeling smaller, more scared, and more separated from the people around us. Here, theatre offers us something truly valuable, even crucial, because above all, theatre is about being human together. At a time when local authority budgets are at breaking point, when there are, and there are, children going to school hungry, when our NHS is often unable to provide what its staff and patients would wish, it is extraordinary and wonderful that people such as you, you in fact, are willing and able to offer your resources, your enterprise and skills to help sustain theatre. Yes, we have had a genuinely world-beating tradition of excellence in theatre making in this country, and it would be a shame to let that wither. But more importantly, we need what theatre gives us as audience members, which is, in the modern parlance, shared safe spaces in which together we can examine ideas and scenarios which may be difficult or strange. And as we go our separate ways, perhaps take that feeling of our common experience of togetherness home. When I was small, I thought theatres were the best place in the world. I feel that way still. At Theatres Trust, we are truly grateful to you. 
Thank you for all you do to help house and support this ancient, simple, completely human art. What you're doing is really important. Thank you. I'd give him the job, wouldn't you? Fantastic. Thank you. Yes, Jack, you've got the job. Um, and thank you, Siobhan, for those inspiring words uh, on the magic and power of theatre and a really welcome reminder why all of us who are in this room do what we do and hopefully will inspire us to keep on fighting the good fight. So thank you for joining us today, both of you. I'm going to hand over now to Claire uh, Appleby, who is the Architecture Advisor at Theatres Trust. Um, she is going to announce the full 2024 list, uh, Theatres at Risk list, and tell us a little bit about some of the uh, themes behind it. Thank you, John, and thank you, Siobhan and Jack, for that wonderful speech. Um, so hello, everyone. I'm Claire Appleby, and I'm the Architecture Advisor at Theatres Trust. And I'm going to give you an overview of the 2024 Theatres at Risk Register, some details about the theatres new to this year's register and about the theatre being removed, as well as speak a little bit about how we actually compile the list. I'm also going to bring you some highlights from our work with theatres on the register uh, over the year. Um, so, Sophia, if you can just pop back a couple of slides um, and we can see the image on the screen of all of the 39 theatres on this year's Theatres at Risk Register. John and Lord Parkinson have already spoken about how important this register is and throughout the year the team at Theatres Trust works with the groups supporting these theatres, the campaign groups, the theatre owners and operators, local councils and other key stakeholders seeking viable solutions to see these magnificent buildings saved and reopened. Next slide please. Before I give details about this year's register, I'm going to talk about how we actually compile the register and explain about the criteria that we use for assessing whether a theatre is added, removed or remains on the list. As a team, we get together annually to review the situation across the theatre sector. And this takes into account those theatres already on the Theatres at Risk register, alongside those that we support through our advice service or that form part of our planning casework. We carefully consider the ca each case using three criteria to assess the theatres. And these criteria cover the immediacy and type of risk that they face, the quality and significance of the building, and the building's importance to the local community and its potential to return to live performance or community use. So the theatres at the top of the list are not just those at greatest risk, they are the theatres of the most architectural, cultural and social value, and the buildings with the most potential to be returned or retained for live performance use by their community. So to give a little bit more detail about these criteria, first the community value. So for a theatre to be on the Theatres at Risk Register, there must be local support and community demand for a theatre as a performance venue. And as already said, the building must also have that potential to be returned to live performance or community use. The second criteria is the STAR rating, and this credits the building's architectural quality, so its workability as a theatre and its social and heritage value. Um, this can also include theatre's geographical uniqueness. So, for example, this may be the only theatre in that area, so such as the case for the Roundhouse Theatre in Dover. The star rating is an important criteria because our register also includes theatres that aren't statutory listed, so um, not grade two, grade two star or category A, B listed. But they are buildings that we believe are excellent examples of theatres. So for example, the Intimate Theatre in the London Borough of Enfield, that's a really important and rare survivor of a rec theatre from the inter and post-war periods. The third criteria is the risk factor. So we assess a level of threat to the building, either as a structure or as theatre operation. So the list includes working theatres with financial or operational issues, such as Thameside Theatre in Greys, Essex. It also includes theatres which are partially open, but require substantial restoration work or financial input to secure their futures, such as the magnificent Morecambe Winter Gardens. And of course, the list also includes those theatres that are vacant and deteriorating. 
Every building is given a score between zero and three in each of these categories. These scores are then added together to give a total risk score up to a maximum of nine points. To be included on the list, a theatre must score a minimum of four points with at least one in each category. Next slide, please. So moving on to the details of this year's list. As I've already said, there are 39 theatres on the 2024 Theatres at Risk Register and the map on your screens illustrates the spread of these throughout the UK. There are 34 in England, three in Scotland and two in Wales. The map also shows the position of the one theatre that we're removing from our Theatres at Risk Register and that's marked in orange and the addition of two theatres to the register which are marked in red. The addition of only two theatres to this year's register may come as a surprise to some. I mean, the sector is undoubtedly facing challenging times. The squeezing of local authority budgets, cuts to subsidy, the cost of living crisis and increased energy, bill, um, energy prices, all following so soon after the pandemic. Um, and as well, of course, of the closure of some theatres due to rack or crumbling concrete. And we are supporting many theatres affected by these issues through our free general advice service. The addition of a building to the theatres at risk register is always considered a last resort. It's the cases where the building is at risk of being permanently lost. So in relation to how we decide when to add a theatre to the register, we ask the question, is a solution to retain theatre provision at the venue being actively sought? Those where the answer is yes are considered at too early a stage to add to the list. However, we're not complacent. We realise it's a really difficult time for the sector, particularly with increasing numbers of local authorities issuing Section 114 notices of financial distress, meaning that they are in effect bankrupt. And unfortunately, it seems likely that we will see more theatres becoming under threat and at risk in the future. So turning to the additions on this year's register, you have the next slide, please. The first of these is the Epstein Theatre in Liverpool, which faces an uncertain future after Liverpool City Council was unable to renew its lease of the building and subsequently the associated management agreement with Epstein Entertainments Limited, the theatre operator. The operator has likewise been unable to agree the new lease terms with the building landlord hence forcing the theatre's closure in the summer. There are no known plans for the theatre's revival or for its long-term future. To give a little bit of background about the theatre, um, it's situated within a very striking five-storey building in central Liverpool, um, formerly known as the Crane Building and now known as Hanover House. The building was constructed in 1913 and the theatre itself was originally conceived as a concert hall for instrumental recitals for the music shop it was built above. The upper levels of the building contained office spaces. The hall was soon converted into a proscenium arch theatre through the construction of a fly tower and stage within a neighbouring building and both building and theatre are grade two listed. It really is a unique theatre and an important and much loved venue that's long served the people of Liverpool. Liverpool Council has welcomed the addition of the Epstein to our Theatres at Risk Register and hopes that, that with the help of Theatres Trust, stakeholders can find a positive way forward to see this beautiful and important Liverpool venue reopened. The second theatre that has been added to the 2024 register is the Grade 2 listed Abbeydale Picture House in Sheffield. This venue has been added to the register due to concerns about the condition of the building, which is in turn affecting its operational viability. Abbeydale Picture House was built in 1920. It was originally constructed as a cinema and included a ballroom and billiards hall within the basement and a lounge and cafe above the entrance foyer. It was converted to cine variety in 1928 with the addition of a stage and dressing rooms. It remains an impressive building and one that has remained largely intact both internally and externally due to sympathetic uses over the years. Currently, the theatre is in private ownership and leased to Creative Arts Development Space, or CADS, a Sheffield-based charity committed to revitalising local buildings for the arts, culture and creative industries. 
It's reopened an event space in the Fly Tower and a separate bar at the front of the building. However, there are issues with the main roof of the building which have yet to be resolved, resulting in deterioration of the auditorium ceiling and in turn, the auditorium no longer being safe for public use. The operation of the venue has therefore become unviable and the building's future uncertain. Urgent action is required to prevent further deterioration and to see this splendid building back in full and viable use. For more information on the additions to this year's register, please do take a look at the pages on our website. And now, on to the next slide and turning to the theatre being removed from the register, Dudley Hippodrome, which was very sadly demolished in autumn 2023. The Hippodrome was a late 1930s purpose-built variety theatre and the last remaining lyric theatre in the metropolitan borough of Dudley. It had been in use as a bingo hall all the way through till 2009, which had kept the building's interior remarkably intact and well-maintained. We first added the Hippodrome to our Theatres at Risk Register in 2010 when it was purchased by the Council and considered for redevelopment. The images on the screen in front of you um, show the kind of progress of the Hippodrome from its heyday right back in the 1930s through to its times as bingo and the centre right image and then on to when it was vacant and owned by the Council um, later on when it was on our at risk register. Repeated attempts by Theatres Trust, along with passionate local community groups, requesting that the council reconsider the theatre's future as a performance venue, sadly went unheeded, and the Hippodrome was demolished by the council in autumn 2023. In its place will be a brand new higher education complex, which has been funded through the council's successful bid to the government's Towns Fund initiative. Theatres Trust did manage to secure an historic recording of the building prior to its demolition. However, this is small comfort to the local campaign group and supporters of the Hippodrome, and we too deeply regret its loss. There is a further theatre on the Theatres at Risk Register that is owned by Dudley Metropolitan Borough Council, and that is Neverton Arts Centre. And with feelings running high about the loss of the Hippodrome, there's more positive news for this theatre as Dudley Council appears keen to ensure that the Netherton Arts Centre, which is currently vacant, returns to community use. It's working with a local community group on a potential lease agreement, which we will hope will see the future of this venue secured. So fingers crossed, an outcome distinctly different to the fate of the Hippodrome. Next slide, please. I'd like to finish by briefly sharing some of the highlights from 2023 and the work that we've been doing with the supporters of those theatres on the register, uh, many of whom will be in the audience today. Can I have the next slide, please? So starting with winter 2023 and February saw the launch of the 2023 Theatres at Risk Register. And at that event, we celebrated the successes of that year, including the removal of three theatres for positive reasons, so a stark contrast to this year. The images of those theatres removed are on the screen, and they are the Walthamstow Granada, which is currently being restored and is to be reopened as Soho Theatre in Walthamstow, Swansea Palace, which is being sensitively restored by the Council and will reopen as an office space with the ability to accommodate small-scale performance and events, and finally, the Century Theatre, a former travelling theatre that is now permanently sited within the newly developed Snibston Colliery Park in Colville in Leicestershire. Next slide, please. The coverage from the Theatres at Risk Register always sparks local interest. And last year, we saw interest from local organisations and community members for the Regent Theatre in Great Yarmouth. We continue to speak to groups and hope that some of this interest may turn out to bring the positive new future that this fantastic theatre deserves. Next slide, please. The winter months were also a busy time for funding successes and Lord Parkinson has already touched on some of these. Uh, so in March, Morecambe Winter Gardens Preservation Trust was awarded £2.74 million of grant funding from the Cultural Development Fund for the first phase of its works. The Groundlings Theatre Trust was successful in its bid to the Community Ownership Fund for a grant to help them purchase their theatre. And the grant award also comes with an element of funding for urgent repairs to this Grade 2 star list of venue. 
Sticking with grade two star listed venues, the Mechanics Institute in Swindon was awarded £10,000 of grant funding from Historic England, which allowed the council to undertake additional and crucial survey work of those difficult, sorry, difficult to reach places, including the fly tower. And at Burnley Empire, they completed security, safety and decontamination works, which were funded through the first round of the Shared Prosperity Fund. Next slide, please. So moving on to the spring months. In April, we announced that we were awarding a total of £60,000 of grants to seven theatres at risk through our Resilient Theatres, Resilient Communities programme. And the image to the far left of the screens shows two of those theatres, so the Victoria in Salford and Tameside Hippodrome in ashton on deline We also held our first Resilient Theatres, Resilient Communities webinar, which was entitled Understanding Heritage. This was also the month that saw positive news for Thameside Theatre in Greys, with its supporter group celebrating news that Thurrock Council had placed the Thameside complex, which includes the theatre, on its list of assets of community value. Being listed as an asset of community value identifies the building's importance to its local community and provides some additional protection from development. So it can be of real value to theatres on our register. Next slide, please. Thank you. In May, we saw the publication of the second phase of the viability study for the Doncaster Grand Theatre. Um, some of you may recall Scott Cardwell from Doncaster Council speaking about this project at last year's Theatres at Risk launch event. The Council is a key part of the consortium that commissioned the viability study, with other members including the Friends of Doncaster Grand Theatre, the Frenchgate Limited Partnership, who are the theatre owners as well as owning and operating the adjacent shopping centre, and Theatres Trust. The report from the study concluded that it would be economically beneficial for the city to work towards reopening this grade two listed Victorian theatre, which has been vacant now for decades. It has also provided a roadmap for the work. The consortium has since widened its membership to include CAST, Doncaster's Theatre, and is now looking to secure initial, fu initial funding for the first stages of the redevelopment plan. Also in May, Theatres Trust attended the second public consultation for Conway Civic Hall. The building owned by the council formerly housed a library on the ground floor and Conway's only theatre on the level above. The theatre closed in 2014 and the site is to be redeveloped. May's consultation was to present proposals by the council's preferred developer, Nautical Point. The developer's plans substantially redevelop the site through a mainly commercial scheme. Following the consultation, we strongly recommended that the proposals were revisited to include community and live performance use. A planning application has just been submitted, I mean, literally this month, and we are pleased to see that there is now mention of this. Um, we are cur currently reviewing the plans and will be responding in due course. Next slide, please. So, on to the summer months. Um, as I've already mentioned, not all the buildings on the Theatres of Risk Register are statutory listed. They're included on our register because we recognise their importance as theatre buildings and to their communities. However, statutory listing does give national recognition of the historical, social and architectural importance of a building. And it also helps to provide some protection to our built heritage. We were therefore pleased to provide our support to community organisation Garston Futures when in July, it submitted a request to list the Garsden Empire. The theatre is a rare surviving example of a city variety house from 1915, which was built to both show theatre and silent film to the local Liverpudlian working class community. Provincial variety theatres of this type are increasingly rare, with estimates that fewer than 20 survive nationally. Garston Empire has been vacant now since 2009, and as you can see from that image on the screen, is in a poor condition. It has previously been under threat of, re of redevelopment for housing, which would have seen the building demolished. And listing is one way to help offer the building protection. This is a theatre for which there is much community love, and we sincerely hope that a positive new future can be found. 
Next slide, please. And also this summer, Morecambe Winter Gardens Preservation Trust launched a campaign to raise funding to restore its wonderful mosaic floor. The fundraiser was successful and the resultant restoration work is shown in the far right image on the screen. And it really is spectacular. On to the autumn months. Um, in September, Burnley Empire Trust hosted their first Heritage Open Day. This allowed the public inside Burnley Empire for the first time since the theatre's closure in the 1990s. The limited number of guided tours sold out instantly, with people coming from across the UK to see the building from themselves. So really proving that broad ranging appeal of both the Empire and the work Burnley Empire Trust. At Derby Hippodrome, Historic England and the Council started investigation and survey works to allow them to compile an urgent works notice on the building, which could ultimately lead to the compulsory purchase of the Hippodrome. My colleague Sean visited site to see the works taking place. In tandem with this work and in preparing for the opportunity that a change in ownership could bring, we have been supporting Derby Hippodrome Restoration Trust and Derbyshire Historic Buildings Trust in developing viable and sustainable plans for the theatre. Also that month, we attended a public consultation for Clare Hall, a building that was added to our theatres at risk register in 2022, following its closure due to the pandemic. The council is now consulting on options for the site, which includes options for both redevelopment of the site, including a new community venue, and also for refurbishment of the existing building and local community groups uh, Save Clare Hall is one of the organisations that has since submitted a proposal. Next slide, please. In October, the Theatre's Trust Advisors visited Leaf Theatre, and it is always so fabulous to be able to visit the buildings on our register and see firsthand the work of the groups involved, and Leith was no exception. Lynn Morrison uh, from Leaf Theatre Trust and who you'll hear from later gave us a wonderful tour around the venue. Um, we also met with their mentor who is supporting them through our Resilient Theatres Resilient Community Skills Bank and more about all of that from Lynn later. On to November, uh, which brought the completion of the urgent repairs to the Rupert Spilsby Session House. The work, which was funded by Historic England, will protect the building from further deterioration while it awaits its full restoration works. Um, and as Lord Parkinson has already said, um, and those of you who attended the launch last year will recall too, the Theatre's restoration is part of a successful levelling up fund bid by East Lindsay Council um, and supported by the team at Spilsby Sessions House. And Tracy Robson from the Sessions House will be speaking later. Uh, Morgan Winter Gardens was in the news again. Uh, so more good news from them when its volunteers were awarded the King's Award for Voluntary Service, which is an award to recognise outstanding work by local volunteer groups to benefit their communities. A really, really great achievement and thoroughly deserved. And it was also a month that saw community group Let's Buy the Amulet launch a community consultation for its theatre in Shepton Mallet. The responses from the consultation were really positive, with the local community hugely supportive of the building being reopened for community and arts use, and once again hosting live performance. Group Let's Buy the Amulet hopes to submit an application to the Community Ownership Fund later this year, and we will continue to support them in developing the information required for this. So finally, turning on to the winter months. Um, and sticking with community ownership fund news, um, and as Lord Parkinson has already said, in December, Ramsbottom Co-op Hall Heritage Trust were successful in their bid to the community ownership fund to purchase the co-op hall. It's a building that was added to the theatres at risk register in 2021, when under threat of redevelopment, which would have seen this rare surviving example of a theatre built by the cooperative movement lost to housing. Theatres Trust was one of the key objectors to the scheme and we subsequently submitted and were successful in getting the building listed. We have since been supporting the group, including the support through the Resilient Theatres, Resilient Community Skills Bank. And we wish the group every success with the purchase and will continue to work with them to see the building reopened. Also in December and on our next slide, uh, Thanet Council published its expression of interest for an operator for the Theatre Royal Margate, 
And I'm delighted to say that Hayley White from Thanet Council will speak more about the theatre and the project later, so I'm not going to give any more away right now. And finally, uh, the new year started positively for campaign group Save Hume Hippodrome, which was awarded a grant from the Architectural Heritage Fund to commission a viability study for the spectacular Hume Hippodrome. Save Hume Hippodrome, a group that we've been supporting since they started out, hopes to restore and reopen the theatre as a local community and arts centre. As with many buildings on the register, ownership is a challenge, but the viability study will be the first step towards evidencing the group's ambitions and helping them achieve their goal to see this building saved for future generations to enjoy. So, uh, on to the next slide, please. Finally, on to the present day, to January 2024, and here we are today at the launch of the 2024 Theatres at Risk Register. So that was just a snapshot of some of the work that goes on with our theatres at risk throughout the year, but the outcomes of those ongoing conversations and discussions with all of the community groups, theatre owners, operators, local authorities, funders and other stakeholders that we regularly liaise and work with to seek positive solutions to finding secure futures for the theatres on the register. We do recognise that the theatre sector is facing a challenging time and we're here to help. We encourage all to seek the opportunity that these buildings create and understand the value that they hold in their communities. Theatres have a vital role in shaping our communities and neighbourhoods and the positive impact that these buildings have on the local economy, increasing footfall, encouraging spend locally, acting as an anchor of regeneration and drawing in potential new residents, visitors and businesses. Now more than ever, it's time for us all to come together to work collaborative, collaboratively and act decisively to see a positive, bright, revitalised future for these theatres. So if you work for a local authority, please do get in touch with us to discuss how to support the theatres in your area. If you are a local business, can you support theatres at risk in your area in kind? For members of the public, tell your local politicians that theatres matter to you. Support crowdfunders if you can. And to everyone, please do share the stories about Theatres at Risk on social media. Further details about the 2024 Theatres at Risk Register, including the full list, the assessment criteria and details about the current situation for each of the theatres on the register can be found on our website. So thank you. Um, and I'm now going to hand over to my colleague, Sean, our Theatres at Risk Advisor and Resilient Theatres Resilient Communities Programme Manager for our next session. Over to you, Sean. Thank you, Claire. So um, I'm here to give an introduction to the work we've been doing as part of our Resilient Theatres Resilient Communities Programme. And then we will be hearing from representatives of three of the theatres at risk who have um, been involved with that programme in different ways in the past 12 months. They'll be talking to us about the progress that have be, has been made with their theatres and some reflections on their engagement with Theatres Trust. Then, um, time permitting, there will be an opportunity for questions for the panel. So um, if you do have anything that you would like to ask, please do type that in the chat. And then my colleague, uh, Rebecca, will be monitoring this and we'll pick up your questions and we'll go through them at the end if we have time. Thank you. So if we move on to my first slide. Um, I'd like to introduce the Resilient Theatres Resilient Communities Programme, which is our multi-strand capacity building support programme. This is a three-year project which is um, generously supported by the National Lottery Heritage Fund, the Pilgrim Trust and Swire Charitable Trust. The programme is still quite new as we're just approaching the end of the first full year of delivery of the activity strands. The main aim of the programme is to reduce the threats to the theatres that are on our at-risk register. And we do this by um, working with the groups that are involved with those theatres and providing them with access to expert advice and support. 
Um, this is a new type of project for Theatres Trust as well, as it's developing the level of support um, and the type of support that we offer groups. As you're hopefully aware, we, we do have an internal um, advice team, a small and dedicated group of people who are providing advice to theatres. Um, however, this project is taking that uh, a step further and giving that in-depth and tailored support, which um, can really bring um, long-lasting benefits to the theatres on the at-risk register. So on the next slide, I'm going to just recap on the activity strands. Some of these have already been touched on by Lord Parkinson and Claire, but just to be clear, we have three levels of activity. The first is training and knowledge sharing. This includes our webinar um, programme, which is open to the entire sector. Um, so far, we've been able to offer webinars on understanding heritage projects, um, fundraising for capital projects for theatres, and uh, developing good governance. If you missed any of them, um, video recordings are available on the Theatre Stress website. And those webinars are also supported by um, handy information sheets, advice notes um, that are also, um, you'll find those online. Alongside that public element of the programme, we've also been running a training programme for um, representatives of theatres at risk. So in the first year, we saw um, members of eight community groups learning about how to strengthen the governance of their organisation. And in year two, the training will be around fundraising. So the second element of this programme is the capacity building grants. As has already been mentioned, we are giving out £60,000 each year to groups that support theatres at risk. In the first year of the programme, we've been very happy to help um, seven groups from our theatres at risk with projects that are to do with capacity building and strategic and organisational development. A bit of a mouthful, organisational development. So we've been happy to support projects looking at governance reviews, um, oral history and digitisation projects, visioning work and things around audience development and community engagement. The application window for year two of the grant um, project is now open and the deadline of 9th of February. So you're, if you are um, working with a theatres at risk and are interested, please do take a look. Then the final element is our skills bank support. Um, we've created a network of consultants that we can draw on to provide additional advice and information to the theatres at risk to supplement the normal activity that goes on in, in our internal advice team. Um, this is intended to provide a short term, a short burst, if you like, of in-depth advice on a particular topic area. We have 76 consultants on the panel with a, a wide geographical reach covering 22 specialist areas. So this support is available free of charge to all of our theatres at risk where we can identify an area or, or issue where this professional input would bring um, real benefit or meaningful change. So next slide, please. So I just thought I would just explain, um, we tell you what we do, but this is why we're doing it. These are the outcomes that we're trying to achieve from the programme. Um, so these activities are about building resilience. Um, resilience is a word that we've heard a lot, particularly since the pandemic, but we're talking about a, an organization's ability to continue to deliver on its purpose when faced with threat and challenge and change. And it involves working on the core of an organization. So in year one, we've seen a real focus on activities to do with governance. That's been apparent in the training, but also in the um, projects that we've supported uh, community groups with. We've also been happy to support work around visioning, strategic planning and engaging with stakeholders. So the second outcome is about developing skills. Um, when theatres at risk engage with this programme, we want the people involved to develop their skills, knowledge and confidence so that they are better equipped to take their organisation forward in the future. We've been able to create opportunities for people to learn from experts, but also from each other, because that sharing element is really important. 
the learning has been topic specific, but also the softer side of um, skills and things that are needed for you as a person to develop, which we can all um, benefit from now and again. So then the third outcome is about engaging more people. This is about encouraging more people within your community to engage with the Theatres at Risk's mission. Now, this issue may be internal. It might be about the makeup of the organisation and, and um, trustee recruitment, for example, which is a big issue for many, many voluntary organisations. It also could be about ex at the external element, how an organisation connects to its local community and its potential audiences for the future. So those are the things that we're all trying to work on. So on my final slide, I just wanted to um, end with a little bit of reflection to demonstrate that this is work in progress. Um, it's a journey. In one way, it's a journey for Theatres Trust because this is a pilot project and we are hoping to learn from our practice and develop our approach as we um, proceed. We also need to recognise that our theatres at risk are on a journey at different stages of development with different support needs. There are two things that are coming through really clearly, which you can see on the slide there. Um, we're recognising that we need to support people. If we're going to be successful in saving theatres at risk, we need to give the people that are working on behalf of these theatres the support they need to develop their skills and confidence and grow and progress with their organisation. And without the drive and passion and commitment of these volunteers and staff members, these theatres would be lost. So it's not just about the building, it's about the people too. The second element is the importance of supporting organisations through change. We'll be shortly hearing from our three speakers all whom, of whom have something positive to say about their theatre's journey. But even positive change can bring challenge and it's important for us to recognise that these um, development points can bring um, tension and conflict and, and need support and development in order for people to navigate that successfully. So these two things are showing us in Theatre Stress that we need to provide flexible support tailored to the needs of the individual groups, which will support them on their unique journey. We're very pleased with the progress that's been made in year one of the project, and we look forward to um, delivering it for the next two years and updating you on, on progress as we're going along. So that's it from me, and I would now like to introduce you to our first speaker. So I'd like to invite Tracy Robson to come to the, um, turn on her camera and be, there she is, that's excellent. So Tracy is um, one of those really valuable trustees I just mentioned and secretary of Spilsby Session House. And thank you Tracy for joining us, over to you. Pleasure, thank you, yes. Um, hopefully there's some slides you to see in just a moment but yes let me introduce myself so yes I am very fortunate um to be one of the trustees of this amazing Spilsby Sessions House building we could just go to the next slide please so I'm just going to take a very short uh, time just to tell you a little bit about the background of Spilsby Sessions House or Spilsby Theatre its significance and potential uh, just tell you a little bit about what we've done in the last 12 months 18 months um, how Theatres Trusts have helped us and what our timeline is for this coming year. So next slide, please. Thank you. So you saw that amazing building um, outside. This is what sadly it looks like inside. Um, it is in a really poor state of repair. Um, Spilsby Sessions House was designed by Henry Kendall. It is a, it is a building of, it's a grade two building. It is a bit building of significant architectural significance as well as um, its historical um, significance. It was built as a court and a house of correction. Uh, most of the prison has now been demolished. Um, it was used as a prison uh, for uh, 50 years and then the prison demolished and but it continued to be used as a court until um, the 1970s. And then it was uh, transformed into a theatre. And I will show you, there's a, another slide in a moment just to show you how the theatre works so well with the, the, the uh, court 
building. But then in 2000s, it went into decline. Um, it was bought by charity. The charity didn't have the funds to keep it, it to keep the building in a good state of repair. And so it really did go into significant de decline. Um, it's, it's lots of mold, fungus. It's just a really sad state of repair. So, but in 2017, um, we started the program to try to to buy the per, buy the building, um, the sessions house, and then our project was initiated. So, next slide, please. Sorry, next slide, please. Thank you. So, um, just on the on the right here is um, just to show you the inside space. So, the the old courtroom is now or was is theatre space obviously as I said the, the the building is no longer you can't actually go in without hard hats and things because the building has cut the ceiling has collapsed um but the and the cells were used as dressing rooms um there was a coach house out, there is a coach house outside which was used as a as a rehearsal space and a workshop so the the, the two uh, the 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 theatre space and what was the old courthouse really work well together. Um, they complement each other. Um, we, we um, as I say, I'll, I'll explain how we plan to reuse the building in a minute, but it, it really does have significance, this building. And a lot of our community have got very fond mem memories of using the building for theatre. Uh, they, they, there was a bar there that was a big community draw and just a lovely space. So next slide, please. So next slides, please. Thank you. So just in terms of its potential, so it is the only dedicated arts and community venue in Spilsby. Spilsby is an area of high deprivation. Um, our nearest cinema, for instance, is a good half an hour drive away. And people, we don't have that really good um, uh, local transport network. So if you don't have a car, it's really difficult to get away. I, I personally, I'm a, a chair of governors for a school and we know that schools are missing out on these theatre experiences, which are so important for children to to be out to, you know, to thrive. And also I'm also treasurer of a local amateur performance group and we have nowhere to 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 perform at the moment. We have to go outside, as which is such a shame. So we intend to make this into a, a whole community building. We really want to use a space in every way to serve the community. Um, so we, we're thinking about live performance and cinema, as well as um, heritage, uh, it, you know, it, um, attractions. So we think that we can serve this, make this as a, a hub for the community, um, not just as a, as a theatre, but as a, a whole visitor attraction. Uh, and it's estimated that it could bring as much as half a million pounds worth of additional visitor money to the to the area. And as I said, it is an area of high deprivation and an additional 80,000 in, in employment, which is, again, very important to this particular area. Have the next slide, please. So where we are now, just in terms of the last, even in the last 18 months, we've managed to buy the building at a peppercorn, peppercorn price. We managed to obtain charity status. And that took us three times to do three attempts before we got it. So that's a, a big achievement for us. And we were awarded 4.9 million levelling up fund. And, you know, we'll go on to how the Theatres Trust have helped us. But we could not be where we are today without their support in, in supporting that bid. Um, East Lindsay District Council agreed to manage the project and, and that was important for us because we'd not VAT registered. Um, if we didn't have their support in managing this project because they can claim back the VAT, there would be an additional 20% onto the cost of the build we would have to find ourselves. So we're really grateful for them doing that. Um, we've set up our board and our project governance and again, the Theatres Trust have been really um crucial to to me personally in helping us um build that project governance which is so important we wouldn't again have the um the, the confidence to get that leveling up fund if we didn't have that governance in place and recently we've built emptied the building to allow digital surveys and emergency works as, it, as um, sean said earlier we had fifty six thousand pounds 
grant given to us, which again was supported by Theatres Trust um, to get that emergency works done. So to get the building watertight again um, and to prevent further deterioration. And now we're uh, very close to the end of REBA 2, which is the surveys and concept design complete uh, and ready to, to, to um, for the next 18 months. The next slide, please. Um, I'm just going to show you our team here. And, and the importance of this is, um, for me, I joined the team in just 18 months ago when, at the start of um, all the things that we just discussed. Um, but it was very daunting for me personally joining this team because there's a, a number of really key, important people here who've got big, big personalities and a, and a, a wealth of experience and knowledge. So Kevin Lockyer, he's been... Um, governor of three prisons. He's chief. He's um, a currently he's chair of the Lincolnshire Partnership. David Start there. Uh, he was chief executive officer at Heritage Lincolnshire. Jean Shafto. She she was um, the, uh, she established the air ambulance in um, or was one of the key people who helped establish the air ambulance in Lincolnshire, which was one of the first of its kind in the UK. And she raised over a million pounds for that. James Brindle, he is um, executive director of Magna Vita. There's a huge people here. And I, when I joined the team, I was thinking, how am I, me, I'm just a project manager with no none of this very significant background that these people have, how am I going to fit in? What is my role going to be? And as Sean said, that in terms of the theatre's trust, given people's skills and knowledge and confidence, they have been immensely helpful to me on that in in particular and um, next slide please so yes how have the theatres trust helped us so just being on the theatres at risk uh, register that brought attention to the challenges and the risk to our theatre as i said it is the only dedicated arts and community venue in spilsby and has significant heritage and architectural um significance um but the just being on the theatre just brought attention to us and and highlighted the importance of rescue importance of rescuing it um and as i said they've they've the theatres trust have continued to provide support and advice um on this in terms of governance i was very fortunate to be able to to invited to join the the cohort the governance cohort last year and that was immensely helpful for me as i said because it did give me those skills that guidance that confidence to um to be able to put that governance in place so that is my role now and we've got those policies that governance and that governance is so important um in ensuring that um other investors and people when we apply for grants that we've got that governance and people can feel safe and they they know that um you know that if they invest money in us it's going to be um, looked after we've got good policies in place we had some one-to-one -one guidance um, and they continue to offer us specialists to help um, build that resilience and reduce risk and as I said they in terms of funding they supported our bid for both for the leveling up fund and for our emergency repairs as I said that that cohort funding we've got um, cohort new group this year on fundraising which would be really helpful because we've still got to we've got to find some funds to to to, to uh, manage the gap between the money that we've raised and the actual cost of our build so really grateful again to be invited to join that cohort this year um, and I think that's going to be really really valuable for us um, next slide please and um, so just in terms of timeline for this year so we as I said we are now at the end of REBA 2 so the concept design is complete and that means also that we should get firmed up estimates um, in terms of how much the, the build is going to cost and then we'll be able to work on uh, what that gap is so March we're going to focus on fundraising we do have a fundraising strategy but we just need to update that and start working on that gap in funds by April, we expect to have tender process in place for the build and then to have that tender awarded in May, June and actually to have the building work start in August. So it's a really exciting and busy year for us. Thank you. Next slide. And that's it from me. Uh, unless anyone has got any questions, I think the questions are at the end, aren't they? But thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tracy. That's excellent to see the progress that's been made 
entering into a really exciting time with your capital project. So we wish you all the best with that. Thank I'm you. looking forward to hearing more about it as it develops. So I'd now like to welcome our next speaker. Um, we're going to be joined by Hayley White, who is the project manager from Thanet District Council, responsible for the project at Theatre Royal Margate. So um, if hey, there we, thank you, Hayley, over to you. Um, thank you, Sean. Um, uh, I'm really delighted to be talking uh, and to be invited to speak uh, at this uh, event with the Theatres Trust. Um, so, yeah, I'm in charge of the Theatre Royal Project and um, started in March last year. Um, I'm going to start at the beginning. So um, the next slide, please. And I'll show you a bit of the history of the theatre. Um, so this is the earliest image we've got, and probably the, one of the only ones, of the Georgian Theatre, built in 1787. Um, when, what you can see is the, the boxed Georgian Theatre, but with a theatre manager's house to the left-hand side. Um, and then on the next slide, there was an alteration made in 1831, and you can see the start of the curve pay box that's coming around the front. Uh, the theatre manager's house to the left still remains. Uh, and then to today. So next slide, please. Oh, have we missed one? Oh, this is Sarah Thorne. So forgive me. This is uh, Sarah Thorne, who was around between the transition between the theatre as it was in its Georgian incarnation and how it looks today in its Victorian. And the reason she's really important is she was one of the few people that made the theatre viable. So she managed to balance the books. <laughs> she was an actor manager of the Theatre Royal. And a key part of its history is really the Britain's first formal drama school was founded at the Theatre Royal by Miss Sarah Thorne in 1885. So she's really important in our history and our, on our historical narrative about participatory theatre and, and drama schools. Next slide, please. And this is what it looks like today. So this was done in 1874, and it's a JT Robinson design, who happened to be Frank Matcham's father-in-law. Um, what you can see here is, is all from that date, with the Georgian theatre is still encased within the building itself. Um, thanks to the Theatres Trust, our heritage statement, which they um, we utilise their funding to write or, or commission the writing of, um, has stated that it's of major and outstanding significance. It is grade two star listed and was listed in 1955 and has been on the theatres at risk register since 2018. Some of the really important features about the theatre are inside. Um, so next slide, please. which you can see it's rather beautiful Carton Pierre plaster work, um, which is the only surviving example of its kind, um, which I also found out was paper mache. So that's an interesting point in the heritage statement. Uh, there's a sunburner, which you can just about see in the middle of the ceiling, which is an old Victorian lighting and ventilation unit. Uh, and what we have also found out is that it's no surprise really given its age, but the theatre is actually a hybrid between a theatre and a musical layout. So these are some of the really important facets of the theatre that we're looking to conserve and restore as part of the project. The next slide, please. So this is an image which is our decode for you, but it's slightly hard to read, that came from our significant statement. And this gives us the plan of the theatre with the age of the walls. So what you can see is the red is the Georgian. Um, the blue and the green are slightly mirrored here, but what we also know is the theatre manager's house that I mentioned earlier actually was encapsulated in Robinson's design. Uh, and brought in to widen the auditorium. So the theatre manager's um, house, the Georgian fascia, still remains within the walls of the theatre. So we've got a Georgian and Victorian theatre sort of hiding within each other. Um, so one of the things we know about the theatre is it's a very tight envelope, which means that the pavement and the, and the space around the building is really tight. It's, it's, it's surrounded by roads and housing, it's on a Georgian square, and that the the actual interior, there's very limited public space. So this, this is one of the reasons why it's struggled 
financially over the years that to do with also the number of seats so we've got 465 seats um, and it's not really enough for it to sustain itself and has has never been since it was built um, and also the lack of bar space means it's very limited in terms of food and beverage offer so tdc bought the theatre in 20 uh, 2007 uh, and then has has tried various different operator models in that time and it actually um, was brought back into TDC's ownership and the lease relinquished in April 22 and it's been dark since then. Um, we've been able to put together a condition report and we know that in order to get it to a working standard, so that's no specialist conservation and, and no specialist sort of modernization, we're looking at 1.5 million. So it's a significant need with the building and that conservation deficit is, is a lot. Um, so we have um, thankfully campaigned to have 2.2 uh, million funding from the town deal. So that's part of a leveling up fund that's coming to Margate. Uh, and the remit for that is about a creative production cluster um, and looking up, scaling up creative production and skills in Margate. Um, so thanks to the Theatres Trust, we received £10,000 from their Resilient Theatre, Resilient Community Grant. And we've been able to put together the Heritage Significant Statement and understand a lot more about the theatre's history and its importance. But also we've commissioned a operator options appraisal and a business case that sits aside this new plan and new vision, which I'm coming on to, about how the theatre runs and who's going to look after this. Um, TDC are really clear it's not appropriate and for them to operate a theatre. Um, we need a specialist in there. Um, at this point, we're also right in the middle of applying to the National Lottery Heritage Fund for a 3.2 million to realise the project. Uh, next slide, please. So this is the new vision, and we're really looking at how heritage, artistic and social and sustainability, mainly focused on financial sustainability, but also wherever we can, including environmental sustainability, all come together in this Venn diagram to kind of realise the potential of both the theatre and um you know the new vision and, and what we're bringing together here and what when we started to look at the building and this sort of tight envelope and some of the constraints of the building we also looked across the road and there's a building called 19 Hawley Square which is grade two listed uh, and was formerly the London Hotel to house patrons of the Theatre Royal so it has a long-standing history of connection with the Theatre Royal. Um, it's also in TDC ownership. So the main part of this new vision is, is bringing that building into the operation of the theatre. Um, and I like to call it as a kind of creative and financial engine, really, um, to support the theatre. And then looking at what we need the theatre and, and this new performing arts cluster to achieve is we want to look at participation. We want local young people who are, you know, becoming more and more disaffected, particularly with the cost of living crisis, to understand the potential in the performing arts and creative careers. We also want to programme using the beautiful, unique heritage stage for a multi-arts programme. And we also want to look at producing and how that might work in in the building and and with the new kind of creative hub as well uh, again part of the theatre's trust funding also allowed us to bring on board bonner keenly side who are um, theatre consultants to look at what the new model for an operator might be so we're right in the middle of that process we've done some early engagement work with operators but we're looking Looking at a commercial venture, uh, an existing theatre company, probably a charity, who would be looking to relocate to Margate or a local consortium to set up a new trust. Um, part of this drive for 19 Hawley Square and this thinking about sustainability is not only sort of the history of the theatre being sort of unsustainable, um, but also the fact that local council subsidy is, is declining. And we wanted to make this work as a business model on its own. And really by providing the additional building and the opportunity for that to make income at 19 Holy Square, um, we're looking for that to replace any subsidy the local authority you know, can no longer provide. So next slide, please. So again, coming back to the Theatre's Trust support. So the Heritage Significant Statement uh, has been really critical. 
and again looks at the architectural, cultural, social importance, um, has really been the linchpin to support our Heritage Fund application and is the start of our conservation management plan to make sure that anything going forward really protects and works with the heritage fabric and conserves where you know where possible and where needed and where that history is is, is present. Um, we've put together the the, the consultants uh, put together the business case for the operator, and that's basically looking at uh, profit and loss for the last five years and working out where you know the theatre could excel and what types of programming and indeed what kind of models um, are coming forward again around is it going to be commercial is it going to be a new trust um, and looking at case studies so like for like theatres um, that are either rural or seaside location we're within 20 miles of the Marlow in Canterbury which is a very large theatre so looking at models um, that match up to see, you know, to looking at best practice uh, in theatres. We launched this operator early engagement, which was like a pre-EOI, just to say, here's our vision. Um, tell us how you might make this work. And I was delighted that we had so much uh, interest. So we had uh, 16 operators who were engaged. And now that the, the kind of surveys and questionnaires have come back, that's transferred into seven who were actually sort of looking at how they might make um, this new vision a reality. Um, as part of this, we also tested the new vision uh, with public engagement uh, with the public. And we had significant interest uh, for that uh, over a two week period and a, a one all day event in the theatre itself. Um, so we're really desired to evidence how important the theatre is, but also being very real around the business case of how it's going to work. How, how does it um, sustain itself? So next slide, please. So I've alluded to 19 Hawley Square, so I thought I'd show you some plans of what that actually looks like. Um, so these are really early sketch plans um, of the old hotel, and this is directly off a, a small road opposite the theatre. So we've got rehearsal rooms in the basement, which um, in rehearsal room two, um, we can actually block out the uh, stage of the theatre uh, royal. So the main house stage can be blocked out. So it's sort of perfect for rehearsals. Um, and then this is the sort of on the ground floor level, which is the sort of longer L-shaped um, image we've got here, plan we've got here. We've got a bar, um, cafe sort of box office. Uh, a green room and a sound studio that feeds, that can also become the tech booth to the studio theatre where we can house sort of 50 people. So you begin to really see this idea of participatory kind of early stage work in progress that sort of feeds into the creative model um, for the theatre. Next slide, please. As we go up the building, we're looking at the first floor to be um, performing arts companies offices with a communal roof garden. So the idea is, is that, you know, um, those are on sort of medium to long term lease uh, and generate income, but also are adding to the performance hub by being performing arts companies. And then the top um, final two floors, so second and third floor, um, we have a real problem of accommodation in, in Margate. And so we've designed here a theatre touring digs. So the idea is these self-catering rooms that are let on a short-term basis to touring companies um, so that there's somewhere to stay. And, you know, we all know that um, performance schedule means, you know, they don't like to be up at 8 a.m. for a bed and breakfast when they're performing till midnight. So um, this will really add value to perhaps residencies, also educational groups, as well as touring companies coming through. So it's really not only the Theatre Royal, but the second building, this auxiliary building that we can, um, we're fortunate enough, TDC own, um, that we've brought into the proposition to sustain the theatre itself. Uh, next slide, please. And so we're on to timeline. So um, <laughs> creative production hub isn't built in a day. Um, so we're looking at, we've largely based this on the National Lottery Heritage Fund timeline, um, because obviously we're looking at significant um, support from them. Um, but ultimately we're looking for a March uh, 2027 opening um, through the various stages and kind of contractors work. 
Um, it also needs to be said that this funding and the, and the project potentially has, has a wider scope. Um, so we're also in conversation with the Arts Council um, as part of their Cultural Development Fund, um, which is uh, administered by the Arts Council, but comes from the DCMS. So we are in conversation with them. Um, yeah, and I think that's our project. Thank you very much, Hayley. You're welcome. Yes, I'm just waiting to reappear. Thank you, Hayley. That's excellent. It's a really informative overview, giving us a real flavour of what it actually takes to move forward with this type of project and also giving us um, really the vision um, and how that's coming alive and indeed um, congratulations really to uh, Thanet Council for being out there pushing this forward um, in, in today's climate that's a, a unique achievement so thank you very much. We now might like to move on with some positive comments in the chat as well confirming that. So we're going to move on to our final speakers who are both are here to talk about Leith Theatre. So I'd like to welcome Anna and Lynn and um, look forward to hearing an um, update on your behalf. Thank you. Hello. Um, can we get our first slide, please? Um, Thank you so much for um, inviting us to speak. I think we're really uh, pleased to be able to be here and reflect and um, so many parallels with, with all the stories. And I, I think it's fascinating to hear the progress. It makes you realize you're not all alone out here. Um, this is a timeline um, and it sort of shows our progress right from inception. And it's really just so that our current progress in 2023 has a bit of context. Um, I think we'll, we'll try and talk you through some of the strategic decisions that we've made um, and then the challenges and, and the reflections um, on the progress to date. Um, you can read all about this on our website, but basically Leith Theatre's political heritage has real relevance in our development. Um, and it means that the community is and always will be a key focus for us. Uh, next slide, please. Um, Lee Theatre has been on the Theatres at Risk Register since 2016, and we're one of the three um, Scottish theatres. Um, this is a, a few images, really, from our early, early operations. The Trust came into this, this challenging environment as a uh, community safety building project, um, rather than a business, and we operated in an ad hoc and reactive way. Um, perhaps a bit unusual in that we were operating at all, to be honest with you. Um, but I think this, this is a really good illustration. Um, it's important to point out, I think, that people at this, at this stage thought that we were already refurbished, um, but actually it was sort of smoke and mirrors, really, by the staff team. Um, next slide, please. So this shows us sort of two years in, we're operating, we're bringing large scale audiences in, um, with pop-up festivals. It's a taste of what could be. It's, it's exciting, but there's no long-term planning here. Uh, we're still very much pop-up. We've got temporary licenses. Uh, we've got a large staff team hiding all the difficulties. Um, we've got a sort of commercial and community balance, slightly misaligned, um, but a good opportunity to open the building, I think. Um, and I think that the progress that we've made recently can really be summed up by sort of two key events in our timeline. And one of those key events was Lynn Morrison being appointed at the end of 2018. Um, and the other was COVID and obviously COVID caused mayhem across the sector. Um, I think it's fair to say that Lynn stepped into this building that was still very much in a community project stage. And um, so there's the challenges there that she stepped into across the building um, across staffing, governance, sustainability, precarious operations. But then she came in and I think this was really the start of our long-term thinking. And it was the start of our strategic planning and sort of looking at, um, looking at it as a sustainable business in the future. 
Um, so just after a year of Lynn in post, she was starting to make those changes and identifying the right people. And then the pandemic loomed into view. Um, and at this time, the Theatres Trust Capacity Building Program um, had funded us. Um, and this was a crucial resource actually. And, and the mentoring and the consultancy that we were able to access at this time was impeccably time for our future development. Um, despite the sort of lockdowns that were in place. Um, I think we're going to explain really how these foundations that we laid in those early days have, have helped to develop our ongoing response to, to the building, um, and point out some of the challenges that we're having to navigate uh, for progress. And for that, I'm going to pass on to Lynn, our Chief Exec. Um, next slide, please. Hi. Hi, thanks, Anna. Um, yeah, it's ironic, isn't it, that um, the pandemic was the thing that offered us the opportunity, and I guess that was the start of a, a business reset and allowed us maybe to make decisions that we'd been unable to make pre-pandemic. Um, so I guess this was the start, a new starting point, and we became a business and startup. Um, it was a chance for us to look at in a new landscape to look at who we wanted to be and how do we want to get there. And so the first step in the pandemic to do that was really tricky and it was a mass redundancy process. So we went from a team of 30 down to two, two members of staff, Anna and myself. Um, but right from the very start, right from the beginning, we identified key pillars um, of focus um, that we were working across. And these were the building, obviously, it was a really important one. Um, our community and wider communities. Creative content was really essential um, if we were to stay alive and be open and produce work. And also heritage, which is a huge part of our business story and of our um, legacy and there was a real clear understanding between us that all of these areas of work had to be considered and developed hand in hand and not at the expense of another and um, so we were wearing multiple hats um, and involved in so many areas of work and spinning plates but always telling our story and ensuring that public and stakeholders were engaged um, and that our doors were open so this was the restart of business development for the theatre. But our critical path, next slide, please. Um, but the, our critical path was also, um, was always to secure a long-term lease for the building, for the business and to be able to present at the City of Edinburgh Council Committee. And to seek a long-term lease, we needed to complete a suite of strategic documents, which for a tiny team was a really mammoth task. And um, this included writing a robust business plan, a fundraising strategy, refreshing a 2018 feasibility study, where we carried out over 100,000 pounds worth of um, building surveys, which gave us a future roadmap. Um, governance was absolutely critical, not only just for strengthening the board, but essentially to recruit a chair, and that's our new chair in post um, last autumn, uh, Bob Last. Um, our starting point in terms of governance was to carry out a skills matrix, which identified some gaps. So it's taken us over two years to make changes to get the board into a position where it can support our future and our next steps. And always the importance of stakeholder engagement. We identified and nurtured relationships throughout all of this time, um, onboarding support for our ambitions, including MSPs, MPs, councillors, funders, uh, community groups and local businesses. But it was the pandemic that gave us the time to pause and to focus without distraction. And the process of starting to create the documents, it be actually became a journey in itself. We increased our business knowledge, we built our networks, we grew braver and bolder, and we are now currently an agile team of four. 
we got to know the building on a completely different level and we started to find answers to help inform our next steps. Underneath all of this was managing expectations. And I have to say that we had to manage our own expectations throughout all of this time uh, and continue to do so. Everything takes longer than you always think it's going to take. Um, the significant milestone for the organisation was to get to city council and get to committee. And pleased to say that in September last year, um, 23, we finally made it to committee and with all of our documents signed off. We secured agreement in principle for the 50 year long term lease, which now allows us to plan for large scale capital funding. Next slide, please. And here she is. In 2018, the City of Edinburgh Council pledged a million pounds to Lee Theatre, and we've been spending this money over the past years en route to committee. We brought electrical power to the main stage in August 2019, just before the pandemic, and, and that was a business lifesaver for sure. It meant that we no longer needed um, generators. The funding also paid for all of our surveys that we carried out in 2021. And all of the work that we've been doing in terms of improvement throughout 2023, which are focused on building health, on getting the building wind and water tight, and all part of our due diligence as we um, walk the road to committee. Next slide, please. As Chief Exec, 2023 has been one of significant project management for me, and it's been a huge part of our public story. Um, this is an Instagram story of plastering progress being made on one of the window arches. And if you follow us on social media, you'll see just how significant some of the building conversation has been. Our public profile is in fact increasingly one of a large scale heritage project. And we've carefully shared our building stories and our improvements online and also in person in the room. This was a period where we carefully focused on developing our network and our communications. Heritage tours and gathering personal stories and also um, capturing memories. Next slide, please. But this project is actually about people and relationships, and it's people that will save this building. Theatres Trust, the Resilient Theatres Resilient Communities Programme, has given us three days of consultancy this year, which has allowed us to access incredible expertise as we work through business change and growth in line with our goals. Um, we can arrange these sessions when we need them. So it feels like this really precious um, consultancy expertise opportunity that um, is confidential. And so in terms of personal growth, I think I'll speak for Anna myself. Um, it, it's been a really significant part of, of uh, identifying next steps. And um, maybe truthfully, uh, with a real coaching approach to helping us find out that some of the answers we know already, we just need the facilitation to bring them out. Um, it's been a year where we've really embedded our organisational culture about how do we want to be, recognising how do we want to be, um, consistently saying thank you um, has been really vital and a real priority. How do we keep people on board, nurture and support for now, and also for our future ambitions? Um, celebrating our wins feels like a really significant weekly process, um, even really tiny ones down to plug sockets. The team meets every Monday and we kickstart the week with goals and we meet every Friday and we share, share our goals and our wins. Um, it's an approach that everyone's important and that we can't do it on our own. Uh, next slide, please. It's exciting because it's all about people and it's about exciting opportunities ahead. There's certainly not a prescribed 
route forward for us. And we've built the platform for nurturing the support across all of our working pillars and to realise a future capital fundraising campaign. Uh, this is some of the social media stories about heritage where we've uh, met some really incredible supporters this year. Next slide, please. And to close, um, the horizon for us was always to secure a long-term lease for the building. But actually, in the last five years that I've been in post, um, it's all been about the people. It's been about developing the team, uh, developing the board, and all of our connecting communities in the, in the wider sense. And so now we are into business next steps. And someone said very recently, post committee, um, actually, Lynn, this is where all the hard work begins. So um, we're ever aware of the risk and the landscape uncertainties and some of the vulnerabilities inherent in a project such as this. But it's such a privilege, I think, to uh, be able to drive um, a campaign for a building that we feel incredibly, a building and a community that we feel incredibly passionate about. And so we move into 2024 with a new horizon um, in view, a large scale capital fundraising and uh, development ambition, and a recognition that the horizon will constantly shift as we continue to move forward. Um, but it's a really exciting time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lynn and Anna. Um, Excellent presentation, really lovely to hear more about what's been happening and I'm sure we'd like to send congratulations to you and the team for that major achievement in securing that agreement for lease. I know we still need to see that formality come into play, but I know you're working really hard for the next stage and uh, securing the future of Leith Theatre, which is what we like to see. So we've come to the end of our presentations now. We do have just a brief opportunity um, to take questions um, for the speakers that are with us today, please. If there's anything that people would like to quickly enter into the chat and I'll just wait for um, anything to come through. Um, if um, Hayley's able to join us again on screen, that's lovely Hayley. Um, so whilst I'm just, my colleague Rebecca is going to um, shout out if anything comes through in the chat, but I just wanted to ask you for your views on um, something. I know um, Tracy has already sort of commented on this on her presentation, but we, we would like to understand what your thoughts are on your theatre being included on Theatre Stress at Risk Register. Because you've heard, we've heard um, how we as an organisation put that together, and just wondered what your views were. I wonder if Anna or Lynn, you would like to comment on that at all. Um, yeah, I, I can. I can comment. I think um, it's really vital for us to be on on the theatres at risk register. I think you you maybe see sort of pictures of us operating and in the past, and I think how I. Um, alluded to it earlier in the presentation you know a lot of that was smoke and mirrors so a lot of that was actually really challenging uh, operation that took you know hours and hours and hours to sort of disguise the fact that it was so difficult and so our story really is almost back at the start of itself again which is we need the capital funding we need to refurbish the space and we need to make it usable and sustainable um, and without the support and, and without being on the list itself I think we lose a really crucial element of that of that story as we as we move on into a, a capital fundraising campaign so I think it's yeah, really that's, important. That's really helpful Anna. Um, Hayley or Tracy anything you'd like to add on that? Um, yeah I mean it's been critical Cool. Um, for us, um, predominantly because uh, of really having specialist advice, um, you know, working in the local government context, you know, they're, they're very busy and, and deal with the, an awful lot of um, 
statutory duties. So actually having the specialist support of the Theatres Trust has been critical to being able to say, you know, this is you know, stepping forward with confidence with some plans and some ideas um, and having that sort of political weight of the Theatres Trust as well as the specialist uh, theatres advice, you know, has been really, really important for me to, to be able to talk to someone like Thanks, Hayley. Tracy, I think you were muted briefly. Yeah. Yeah, I think I've already I've already really said quite a lot about this. I, it's been it's been really, really important for to us so to highlight the, the need for our theatre to be restored. That's lovely. So I'm just going to check. I hadn't noticed anything in the chat. Um my colleague will shout out if I've missed anything. So let's just close. When when you um, all were presenting, you all showed a timeline. And partly something I reflected on was that um, all of our theatres at risk are at different stages in their development. And there'll be people on the call here, here today who are um, at that campaign stage or are right at the beginning of work to try and save their theatre, waiting for circumstances to change or that development. So I just wondered, looking back from where you are now, is there any um, uh, tips or reflections or anything that you'd like to offer up to people who are um, still at that initial stage in their journey? Anyone like to take that first? Lynn, maybe? Lynn's got a hand up. Great. Um, yes, I, I mean, I guess that's where the management expectation comes in. Um, but to take stock and look back and reflect how far you've come, sometimes I think it's easy to get too close to the... Uh, you can't see the wood for the trees. And um, so enjoy the journey. And uh, it's about the journey, not just the final destination. Um, I think that would sum up the last five years, really. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Anyone else like to share? Ailey. Um, for me, it's about having a really strong narrative and a really strong vision and asking people if that's what they want um, and then being open to that changing as you go through the project. Um, but also at a certain point, then cementing that vision and saying, OK, everyone wants this, so let's do that. Um, and, and then you can you can um, garner support with that because it becomes clearer about what what specific thing you're going to do. Yeah, that's great. Helpful advice. And Tracy, final final words of wisdom from you. Yeah, I think even it, so, some sometimes the process can seem like hurry up and wait. So there's always there's something d desperate to do in the next month, and then there's nothing to do for a while. But I think there's always things you can be doing, and even if it's reaching out and making connections with other people who are in a similar, you know, on the same journey but maybe in a different place, I think that can be really helpful. Um, or if it's in looking at your governance and 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 building those foundations to make sure that you've got solid ground to move forward in. I think there's there's always things you can be doing even if you're in a period of not being able to move forward in the way that you would want yeah that's great that's great thank you very much for sharing and I would like to express a big thank you to you all for taking your time and your busy schedules to come here today and share um, your stories because it's really lovely to make things come alive to hear about the progress that's been made Thanks very much. So I'm just going to hand back now to um, John for some closing words. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Sean. And uh, thank you, Tracy, Haley, Lynn and Anna. Uh, really encouraging to see all the fantastic uh, progress you guys have made and indeed all the other theatres that uh, have been featured in, uh, in today's talks. Uh, today's discussions have really highlighted how important it is that we work in partnership. And we attempt to do that with every theatre uh, on the theatre at risk list. Um, so, yeah, I'm really hopeful. I'm really feeling quite optimistic in spite of the challenging times we're going through that many of the theatres that uh, we've talked about today are making such good progress. Before I finish, I'd just like to thank all of today's speakers, our panellists who've just spoken, Lord Parkinson, Siobhan Redmond, Ablia uh, helped by Jack Davenport and all our other particip participants. 
I'd also like to say a big thank you to Tizers Live for sponsoring today's event and to every one of you who has joined us today. We look forward to seeing you again in the future.